achieve that everything seems to work. Okay. So that's that's good. Yeah. And I have time until five, isn't it? That's yes. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Solin here and Arno is with the Alto University in, in Finland and uh, he's going to be talking about state space methods uh, for temporal Gaussian processes. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very very happy to be here. Uh, this is actually my second time at the GP summer school. Uh, the previous time I was here was in 2013 which was some years ago as a first year PhD student. So uh, yeah, I haven't been here in, in, in between. So, uh, and I see that it's actually grown a bit. Uh, some of the presenters are still the same. Um, <laughs> and some are new. But then uh, I guess uh, there's sort of like new things also like being presented. So not all the contents are, are old. So uh, this is the last talk uh, in the summer school. And um, many of the topics sort of yesterday and, and today are more, more, more advanced kind of. But now we are kind of going a bit back to basics, really like looking at like core fundamentals of GPs uh, and like even like simpler things than, than you, you looked at uh, on the first two lectures. Great, uh, so let's get started. Uh, state space methods for temporal GPs. And uh, well, um, you might, might recognize some st stuff quite soon. So the outline for this, this hour is that uh, I try to motivate this a bit, uh, tell about what I mean by temporal models in this case. Um, then I'm providing some sort of uh, views into GPs, how you can interpret these models from different points of view. Uh, you are probably familiar with, with GPs uh, from the machine learning point of view, but there are uh, GPs uh, occurring and being used in many other disciplines uh, and uh, fields than just, just machine learning. Um, and then we go into the actual sort of uh, methods and what to do with them. Uh, I'm mostly talking about like the priors, GP priors, but then there's a tiny bit actually about coupling that with some actual observations, some data. And then uh, also sort of going from just temporal models to things that uh, are spatial temporal, something that's sort of more general things that evolve over time, like spatial fields or so on. Uh, and then I have a bit of sort of uh, fun or interesting applications uh, where these things can be used, just <coughs> to give you some, some ideas and insights. And then we will uh, like end with a short recap. Great, uh, so uh, time to get you motivated. So, um, well, one dimensional problems, uh, time series basically, uh, they're typically like data sets and problems where the data has sort of a natural ordering. You can order the inputs 
in sort of only one order because you have like timestamps for them. So there's a natural way of dealing with the order of data. Uh, this is not true in, in sort of more general cases. If you think of your spatial problem, then there's no sort of natural way of ordering the data because sort of you can consider either these data points first or then these data points or then the neighborhood around those or so on. But for time series, it's simple because just sort of you order them in time and you can uh, look at them in a temporal order. So that might be, for example, just an example of, uh, of like modeling the number of birds uh, in the US over sort of uh, several decades. We will get back to this example a bit later on, but then sort of there's a certain number of babies born every day and you get sort of one data point per day, a time series. I'm sure you all know what a time series is. Um, so then spatiotemporal models. So, uh, okay, it might be that you don't only have like one thing that evolves over time, like that was the number of birds. But then if you think that you would have uh, the number of babies born in, uh, in every city in the US, for example, for every day. So then there would be sort of a label which would be the city or the spatial location of, of where the babies are born, like the hospitals or, or, or so. So then you would already have, already have more labels than just, just the time. So uh, like a very simple example would be the, the amount of rainfall in some area. So you have, have a certain uh, amount of rain per day so that gives you data points for every day at uh, different locations. They're like these weather stations measuring these things. And then you have that data accumulating over time. So it's like a spatial, which might be sort of an actual spatial coordinate, or then some other kind of labels that you have. And then again, you have time, so spatial temporal. Um, and of course, like if you think of uh, like problems in like brain data modeling or so, there's often something like, stuff happens in your in your head and then there's like a temporal component that then sort of things change over time this is actually my brain uh, I was in the brain scan and get the actual data and then my wife added some of the the, the things around uh, I'm not quite sure what, what she means by, by this part uh, but well I think it's a nice nice figure um, uh, and of course like then if you think of more general things uh, time points, you, you keep accumulating observations of temperature or, <laughs> or whatever. So uh, you might actually have sort of a continuous stream or unbounded time series. And that would be the case, for example, in many like sensor uh, data applications. So for example, if you think of, of smartphones, these, these bad boys have a lot of sensors in them, like IMUs, uh, all kinds of uh, like camera sensors, light sensors, and so on, which can sample data at like tens or hundreds of hertz. So you get actually a lot of data accumulating over time. So it would be, of course, very nice to be able to do like GP modeling for these sort of applications. And that's, that's what we are like interested in, in in this talk. So, okay, uh, I promise to give you some like different insights to GPs. So if this, uh, this ball here represents GPs. So what has been <laughs> most looked into in the, in the previous three days is sort of the uh, typical machine learning way of, of interpreting Gaussian processes. So basically, all the interesting stuff happens in the, in the covariance function, the, the kernel. And of course, like you, you can have a mean function as well, but that's, that's not very interesting uh, because you can put all of that information inside the, the covariance function. So it's all about the covariance function. That's where you sort of your prior knowledge is encoded. And of course, like uh, it's not always easy to encode the prior knowledge. You might go and talk to an expert who says that, well, well, uh, uh, you ask what sort of prior knowledge he has about the, the, the thing you are modeling, and he says, well, it's green. And then I'm like, ah, oh, how do I encode this this, this color into into this this model? I know about smoothness and differentiability. Um, so then it's not always apparent how to encode the knowledge you have into the kernel. But luckily, the same thing can like, be represented by other means as well. So uh, especially in singular processing, um, the typical way of looking into, into uh, Gaussian processes is actually true like a, like a spectral, spectral density 
uh, approach. Um, and I call it like the Fourier approach here. Um, but then there's a third uh, interpretation of these things, which is sort of a path in interpretation. So you can think of these as sort of as a, you, you just have a lot of sample paths, and that's how you characterize your, your GP model. And these are all equivalent, at least in some cases. Um, so you can actually sort of encode the same prior knowledge with a covariance function, with a spectral density, or as a state-based model. And it's exactly the same model in the end. Good. Um, so let's start uh, by sort of uh, going through uh, the normal, normal way that you have been looking into these past three days. So uh, this would be the kind of model that uh, you should be quite familiar with at this point. So you have a GP prior, uh, some functions f, which follows a uh, Gaussian process with some mean function and the covariance function. Now notice that uh, I'm not no noting the inputs by x. I'm choosing t, time. So t is now one dimensional variable. And then you might have some observations. Uh, you couple the, the latent uh, GP model with your observations through a likelihood model uh, or your observations y here in this case. So uh, let's focus on the GP prior now because that's maybe the more challenging part in, in the sort of first case. That's the first thing you encounter when you're building a GP model and already there you have lots of things to deal with. And we are interested in, in temporal GPs. Uh, so t here is just a scalar variable, like time series models. And of course, like the, the, uh, the kernel representation uh, or moment representation comes from having like a, a uh, mean function and a covariance function which characterize your, your latents. And as you noticed, GPs are great for model specification. Uh, but then what can be tricky is that once you didn't have some data, you need to expand a covariance matrix. You cannot deal with the covariance function then in actual computations. So then you encounter the notorious like uh, Owen cubed computational scaling, which is a bit unfortunate, of course. OK, uh, let's continue from there. Uh, so the next uh, view into these things uh, is the spectral or the Fourier representation. So I guess already yesterday someone mentioned uh, the Fourier transform and this is should be uh, well like a basic tool in your toolbox basically. So uh, I'm defining my, my uh, Fourier transform like this. Um, so for stationary Gaussian processes where the kernel is stationary uh, I'll just misuse the, the notation here a bit. Uh, there is something called the wiener kinchin theorem, which actually uh, couples the, the uh, covariance function with an associated spectral density, uh, basically the Fourier transform of the covariance function you have. So Fourier transforming the uh, stationary covariance function gives you a spectral density function and that is sort of equivalent to, to, to the kernel you're dealing with. So these are sort of kind of interchangeable between each other. So then the kind of quite different viewpoint into these things is the state space uh, representation or the stochastic differential equation representation. So instead of characterizing the behavior by some uh, uh, weird entity like a kernel or a spectral density, let's just try to write out what the evolution of the, the sample trajectories look like. And the very nice thing is that because if these are uh, GPs of certain kind, you can actually represent the evolution as an SD, a stochastic different equation. And the very nice thing is that uh, many, many, many common uh, GP priors can actually be represented in a very, very simple and convenient form 
uh, of linear and time invariant SDs. Meaning that you actually have, uh, this would be, if I cover this by my hand, this would just be an ODE. Uh, where F and L are some matrices of suitable dimensionality, depending on your prior. Uh, and this here now uh, is basically a Wiener process, uh, this beta here. And maybe in a sort of more sort of uh, convenient form for, for, uh, for machine learning researchers, typically, is sort of the white noise representation, which is a bit informal, but actually very convenient in interpretation. So now you basically have an ODE model with some F, which is just a matrix, uh, where you add white noise through some some matrix L, this is like a multidimensional white noise process. So which basically sort of disturbs your ODE. Uh, so basically every time you would solve this ODE, because there's noise sort of injected into the system, you will get a different solution. Which sounds like a nightmare for high school students who are learning their first sort of ODE solving stuff. But actually it's a very convenient way of representing sort of uncertainty and, and uh, stochasticity in these trajectories. And turns out that if you choose your drift matrix, this is called the drift, F, and your diffusion matrix, L, it's this part here in front of the, the noisy part, um, and uh, also the spectral density matrix, uh, the kind of continuous time covariance for the white noise, uh, in suitable manners, you actually get the representation of several typical covariance functions. So there's like a one-to-one -one connection between a big family of stationary and also non-stationary covariance functions, which you encounter sort of you know, when you do GP models, which actually can be mapped to models of this kind. Uh, additionally then, because sort of here the trick is that you wrap sort of you hide stuff inside uh, like a low dimensional or well, dim dimensionality might di uh, depend a bit. <coughs> or the state dimensionality might be uh, like two or three or four or five dimensional here. So you also have like, you know, like a mapping from that uh, vector valued, valued uh, function to then your f, which would be the same as, as you had there in the kernel representation. Please. They are not functions, yeah. That is a linear time invariant model, so they are just fixed matrices depending basically on your hyperparameters. Yeah. I have an example later on. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need to sort of take leap of faith at this point and just trust me that this will turn out nicely. Um, good. Um, so then some more, more tricks. Uh, this is more sort of like quite bluntly just put here because uh, I was only given one hour. Uh, and yeah, it's a bit short to cover everything. Uh, but all the details and how to derive these things are then in the bibliography at the end. So, um, so this is sort of nice that uh, you can actually recover the one-to-one -one mappings between actually evaluating your kernel from these F and H and then like a stationary initial uh, state covariance matrix. And the same goes for the spectral density as well. So if you are sort of come up with the representation uh, of F and L and, uh, and uh, the QC uh, and H for your uh, kernel of interest, you can actually go back and forth between these representations quite easily. Good. So then, uh, OK, now we have. I've introduced a lot of variables and, and, and explained uh, that, yeah, yeah, you can do this one-to-one -one mapping between these stochastic differential equations, which sort of have white noise ejected into them and so on, uh, and this, this normal, normal way of how you think of GPs. Um, but there's sort of still steps to take before this is useful. So similar to how you deal with the, the kernel function, you cannot actually do much computation with the, the kernel per se. 
you need to evaluate that into a covariance matrix, like a gram matrix. The same goes for SDEs. So the SD lives in a sort of weird continuous time, well, not weird, it's a continuous time space. Um, but your data is discrete, and your observations are at discrete time points. So you somehow need to sort of get those solutions to that stochastic differential equation at those discrete points to actually be able to implement this thing in, in practice. Uh, and of course, like solving SDEs in general is quite hard. It requires numerical methods and there's a lot of like pitfalls that you, you might end up with there. Uh, but again, because this particular SD that you end up with is of the sort of most nice kind. It's linear and time invariant. So it turns out that that model can be solved exactly. There's a closed form solution for that kind of stochastic differential equations. Uh, so if you think of a discrete time evolution equation, here uh, f is now uh, just like a, not a function anymore. It's just an indexed vector uh, over the time points that you're interested in. And then you have some matrix A, which tells about the evolution from the previous F, plus some uh, Gaussian noise following some, some, some Gaussian distribution with, uh, in this case, mean zero and uh, covariance uh, matrix Q. And then how to get this, this A and Q is now the crucial thing in representing this thing as a discrete time state space model. And turns out that the LTI linear time uh, invariant SD can be solved uh, uh, simply by evaluating uh, equations like this, where, well, you still have this ugly integral here, but there are several tricks how to actually solve that in closed form. Uh, so for example, if the model is stationary, uh, you can simply uh, do a trick like this. So which sort of ends up you only need to evaluate a matrix exponential of the state dimensionality for, for every time step or every different delta t that you have. So three views. Uh, well, there was the covariance function view and the spectral density view. Can any one of you say that which covariance function this might be? Matern, okay, yeah, so it's of the Matern family, yeah. But which which one in particular? If you look at the covariance function, the behavior here around zero. Yeah, Matern one half, the exponential. Uh, and then you can then see that the behavior here, there, is then sort of the behavior sort of uh, in the spectral density, uh, the similar behaviors is sort of here in the tails. And the tail behavior here is, is uh, on the top, sort of. It seems a lot smoother there. And then the, the sample, sample functions, then, the, the state space representation of this would give something like this when you, you evaluate the, 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 the state space model. And what would the state space models look like? So this is the, the uh, covariance function. Uh, this would be the, the Fourier transform of that, the spectral density. And this would be the SD. So there's white noise, uh, then that parameter simply appears here. Uh, well, it's one dimension, the state dimensionality is just one. These are just scalar functions. So this is uh, sort of the, the simplest case. Then of course, when you go to a Matern 3.2, Matern 5.2, the 3.2 would be, uh, have a state dimensionality of two. You actually have extra valued functions and a matrix here in front instead. And uh, of course, becoming much more complicated. Uh, but then phi 2 would be three-dimensional and so on. So actually sort of what you notice is that because you inject white noise, then the smoother the, the sample trajectories are, the, the more complicated your model becomes because smooth things are challenging for this. Or 
So basically here, because of the, the module is, is linear and time invariant. So that's sort of, it's, it's so nice, it's like the, the simplest kind of SD model you have. So you have guarantees for the solutions to be unique and so on. So that's sort of, it, that's why it's very, very sort of lucky in a way that it's of this kind, the model. Yeah, yeah, so for example, uh, that would be the, the, the oh, yeah, so from the maternal family you would stack the derivatives of f and the, the second derivative and so on. But that's, that's only for, for this, this case, so yeah. That's kind of not a higher order, so it's a kind of a higher order differential equation, sort of. Exactly, yes, exactly, yeah. Good, okay, I've been talking about modern one, two, but there, there's a lot of models, typical models, that you can actually turn into this, this form. Uh, some of them are exact, while the constant and linear covariance functions, uh, maybe not that interesting, but yes, you can formulate them in, in, in this way. Uh, the Wiener process and the Wiener velocity, like the integrated Wiener process covariance functions, uh, they are non-stationary and actually quite interesting. Uh, I think they are actually quite powerful methods that you rarely see used in, in, in uh, many machine learning applications. And then there are the usual suspects, like the exponential, the matern, 3252, so on. And as a limiting case, the squared exponential, uh, well, or the exponentiated quadratic, as Neil likes to say. Um, which, of course, is infinitely smooth. So here, sort of, you need to approximate. Up till here, all these are exact. You ha they have an exact state space representation. But then for the squared exponential, uh, it's actually an approximation. A very good one, though, but still, uh, you need to approximate it. And then, of course, like the, the RQ, uh, the standard periodic, then a quasi periodic, and white noise, so, and so on. So basically, all stationary covariance functions. And a whole bunch of, of non-stationary ones can be represented in this, this form. Good. Um, yeah. So uh, to sum up, the covariance function needs to be Markovian, which sort of makes sense because you set up a state space model where sort of uh, it's sequential. So like the, the previous state then affects the next one, and it forgets its past. So it makes very much sense it needs to be Markovian. Um, so of course, like a uh, lot of uh, stationary and non-stationary models, and the nice thing is actually that you can derive the if you have sums of kernels, which are typical when you build like larger models, or you have products of kernels. So they are like equivalent operations to extend your state space uh, model to actually account for sums and products as well, which makes this actually a very nice sort of building tool. For, for models. Um, so just as an example, uh, here I have a bunch of data. I just want to do the, the normal thing. I want to, to do GP regression here. Um, so the, the, the vanilla approach would be to just evaluate, evaluate these, these uh, covariances, matrices here, and invert, or well, in practice, you would probably make a some sort of solve of there, but in any case. Uh, and then you get, get the solution. This would be the, the, uh, the blue line is the mean, and the dashed lines are the, uh, probably like uh, one, one or two, two standard deviations. So then, yeah. Can you comment on the Markovianity process here? Once again, so what exactly should be Markovian? Yes, the kernel is called Markovian if it has some representation in, in terms of, of a state space model of this kind. So that you can write an evolution uh, with sort of a, an extended state, uh, which, for example, in the case of the modern covariance functions, might be that you have, you have like stacked derivatives. Sure. So it's not only the function value itself, but also if you know the derivatives at the previous step, then sort of you can write out the evolution to the next step and so on. Okay. Yeah. So it's confusing because uh, there's a lot of sort of hidden stuff in the, the state. For example, derivatives can, can be there. So 
it's it's not sort of straightforward to what someone would might think of. Yeah, non-trivial temporal correlations. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can have very complicated correlations, like periodic things and so on. No, because you would need to have like an infinite dimensional state. You would have like infinite number of derivatives stacked. Mm. But of course, if you take the six first derivatives, uh, it's hard to tell <laughs> tell apart uh, after that. Okay, so then let's look at the same problem now, uh, but let's transform the the covariance function uh, to a state space model first. So you get that that A and Q matrices. Uh, and the nice thing is now that, okay, it's, it's like a linear Gaussian system. And turns out that there's a very good algorithm with a special name for solving these kind of systems. It's called the Kalman filter. Are you all familiar with the Kalman filter from before? Good, yeah. So I, I put the equations here anyway. So it's, it's a lot more matrices to multiply. Small matrices that are multiplied with each other. Uh, but the key is that they are small. There's no one big matrix of size of the data, but you have a lot of small matrices that, that then sort of do the same operations. Kind of. So the Kalman filter, you have like a prediction step, and then if you have data, you do an up Kalman update, and then you sequentially go through your data points. And then because you want to condition all the data you have, so in this case, of course, the, the model is only conditioned on the data, data points it's seen so then uh, you need to do like a backward pass. And that's called the Rautung Striebel smoother, the RTS smoother. So where you sort of then have your filtering solution and then you pass backwards to the data and update, update the, the, the uh, state uh, to correspond to sort of the uh, conditioning on all, all the data. Uh, and of course, like you can then evaluate the, the marginal mean and variance by this. And of course, also like as a byproduct of the Kalman filtering, you can also evaluate the marginal likelihood. And now the key is that because you can pass through the data sequentially, like one data point at a time, you are not cubic in the number of data points anymore. You are linear. So ta-da! We just reduce the cubic computational complexity to linear in n. Who thinks that is really cool? Oh, <laughs> only two people. Yeah. I have an example of that. So here you see the sort of it's passed through the data one point at a time, and then there's a backward pass. And that gives exactly the same solution as inverting the covariance matrix. Now you think this is cool. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So my personal opinion and view is that if you have a temporal problem, this is the only sensible way to do inference there, to deal with the latents. Because you really are linear time. And not only linear time, also linear in memory. But there must be a catch. I mean, there must be a price to pay, right? <laughs> The problem is, is sort of, of course, it's a lot more complicated to implement. <laughs> and uh, of course, like for medium-sized problems, like uh, matrix libraries like BLAS and LAPAC, they have been optimized very well. So if you have a problem with, say, less than 1,000 data points, uh, the, the, like the speed benefits you get from this are probably like non-existent. But this really enables you to do like very long time series models. Like, I mean, by very long, millions of data points, because you're linear. There's like no sort of problem there. The conditions that you need for this are that you need uh, a Markovian, so this won't, will this, this won't work with your, if you don't truncate your Stradex, your exponential state space quadratic, you are in trouble. Yeah. But if you do truncate it. But I think, I think Nicola said, that you shouldn't use the square exponential. No, no, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, so that doesn't the problem. <laughs> yeah. But like that's the that's one of the things that you the other thing time order. Yeah. And of course it works for one D time series models. So that's that's the catch maybe. Yeah. 
So uh, let's go back to the number of birds in the US. Um, so it's the, uh, sure. Uh, one step ahead, yeah, that's enough. If you want, just want to make one step ahead predictions, then it's enough to run the filter, indeed. And how the, the smooth, so you would say you have a, a up to quite steep, right? And then you, you run, run the, uh, the smoothing back. How does this smoothing help you to predict one step ahead? It doesn't help. It doesn't help at all? No. Because the filter has already seen all the data. Yeah. It's, I would interpret that that way. So if you want to make sort of, if your data is here and you would want to predict outside the data, so then sort of once you have run the filter up till this point, you've already seen all the data. So there's no sort of benefit in running the backwards booter if you're only interested in predicting the next step. Mm, so here, uh, just to sort of underline that you can really do quite complicated models. So uh, we have some 7,000 uh, days of, of childs being born. And then we have like a long length scale matern uh, with, which is quite smooth. And then like a shorter, like a shorter length scale, uh, not quite so smooth matern. Uh, and then like a periodic with like a year, uh, with the per like a period is one year. And that is time changing, it's like multiplied with a matern. And then we have like a day of week, uh, sort of uh, periodic, which is also multiplied by, by a matern. I didn't come up with this model. It's in, it's in the book by, by Gelman et al. Um, so then, uh, well then, there's a lot of hyperparameters, of course, uh, in, in these, these, uh, these kernels here. Uh, but those we can learn by uh, maximizing with respect to the marginal likelihood. And then this is what what we get by running the state space stuff. And how many of you have read the book, by the way? You should read, actually, a very good book. So Bayesian Data Analysis by Andrew Gelman and uh, co-authors. Write that down, by the book. It's a very good book. So this picture is on the cover of the book. So once you go to the bookshop and buy the book, you can then compare. And it actually is the same solution. There is like a short comment here, uh, which is actually quite interesting. Just checking what, how much time I have left. Um, so if you think of the, the covariance matrix, like the gram matrix evaluated for, for various points, uh, the inverse of that is, is called the precision matrix. And a very interesting thing is that uh, for Markovian models, this precision matrix actually sparse. Uh, it's like block diagonal so like you have some blocks here on the diagonal of like the state dimensionality and then you have like off diagonal blocks on both sides of that and uh, turns out that you can actually evaluate that directly from the, the state uh, matrices by which uh, size of the block determines the precision the, the size of the block is determined by the, the covariance function you have so basically uh, if it's just a an exponential, it's just like single values, so it's just like a tri-diagonal uh, matrix. Uh, if it's a matter in tree two, then the state dimensionality is, for example, two, so there's like two by two matrices on the diagonal, uh, and so on. If it's a product and so on, so on of several covariance functions, then it can be twenty or thirty even sort of easily. So the smoother kernel becomes. More compli yeah, more complicated becomes. Yeah. Indeed. So then you can just write down, uh, after doing a lot of derivations, what the, the precision matrix, what the inverse, inverse actually can be written out in this form. And there's a lot of zeros here. So this, this gives the, the, uh, <coughs> the tridiagonal matrix then. And of course, if you, like this is of size, number of data points times the number of state variables you have. So if you're interested in the, the uh, inverse of the covariance matrix 
which was on the previous page, then you need to like pass that through sort of the, the observation model you have. This, yeah. Uh, and this works in multiple dimensions as well, or do you say this one? Yeah, this, this thing with, with the, the state space model only works in 1D, in this form. So no blended matrix uh, if I have uh, two views with space? No, not in general. <laughs> Even for mass and uh, uh, Well, uh, this is an interesting discussion per se. Uh, there are a lot of sort of like, if you think of there's something called like the spatial Markovian, uh, like Markovianity, where you have to consider a small neighborhood. And then you can do like approximations based on this, which actually gives you sparse precision <coughs> matrices in the end. There's very nice publications and work, work on this, uh, also how to utilize that. But it's slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then a comment on, on well, you, you, this was mostly for dealing with the latent, like the, the GP prior. And that's sort of where the, it, this is actually very interesting because you can avoid that costly matrix inversion by, by doing all this, this, this stuff. But then in practice, you want then to couple your, your fancy state space method with, with your likelihood when you're sort of specified your model in the first place. So you want to have the data entering somewhere. Uh, and then for general likelihoods, uh, it can be confusing, um, I admit. Um, but I think the, the sort of take home message should be that, well, deal with the latent functions uh, using the state space approach. Uh, but then use your favorite approximation scheme for dealing with the like, non Gaussian likelihood, which, of course, you need to probably to approximate or, or sample or, or whatever you do. But then you can still inside your, your big model solving scheme use the state space representation for the latents. And then, then uh, well, you could do like Laplace approximation, you could do VB, you could do like direct KL minimization, EP, or then there's a special type of EP where you only pass once through the, through the data, which is not a single sweep EP, or assume density filtering in signal processing. Uh, and all these can be uh, evaluated in terms of having like a Kalman filter forward and backward pass inside. This is, uh, yeah, this is all like box of worms uh, to, to open. Uh, but then uh, if you're interested in this, uh, I have a couple of papers in the, in the bibliography that you could check out. Um, yeah. After all, it's not surprising that these Mar Markovian models we can we can convert them into a order of n because because most of the matrix is actually zero, right? Because most of the covariance. Matrix. Exactly. Yeah. So in other words, you can also say that can't we deal with this matrix as a sparse matrix and employ methods for in inverting the matrix as a spar sparse matrix and then not bother about this. Uh, um, yeah, this, this is a state space. space. Yeah, this is especially tempting because that would allow you to plug this stuff directly into TensorFlow, for example. And if you're interested, uh, have a look at Nicholas, uh, who was talking the day before. Yeah, so he has a, has a paper at AI Stats uh, that was published at AI Stats last uh, spring, at some point. Um, on this, uh, it's in the bibliography, where they do exactly this. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of other papers, for example, by Alexander Grigorievsky uh, from like two years ago, where they also actually do this. So like deal with the sparse, try to do like sparse solvers in, in this. Turns out that you tend to get a lot more like numerical difficulties uh, when doing that than actually doing the Kalman filtering forward backward pass. That's a very short comment there. Uh, an example of dealing with, with uh, non gaussian likelihoods, let's consider uh, the observations of commercial airline accidents for the past around 100 years. So this data uh, we scraped with Hannes Nikisch from Wikipedia. They have a very nice page with all airline crashes, um, which is actually quite interesting. They have been all sort of crazy stuff back in the day. Uh, not that interesting in like the recent years, luckily. Uh, so well, we scraped all the dates 
So the observations are the dates when there has been an accident. And then we, we have like a log Gaussian Cox process model for, for the intensity of, of airline accidents, basically. That means a Poisson likelihood. And uh, well, 100 years, we do daily binning. So we have like bins of size one day. And then we count for every day how many accidents there were. And that's the, that's the data. So the number of data points is basically 36,000. Which sounds like a lot, but turns out not to be that many than if you're linear time. Uh, then uh, I've set up a model where there's like, a, again, some like periodicity and like a trend and so on. And again, uh, let's optimize the hyperparameters with respect to the marginal likelihood. And this is what we get out. And it's a bit hard to read because there's a lot of like periodic things happening on like even on a week level. So let's visualize it in a different way. So here are the years, here are the months, and every point here is an accident. And then what is visualized underneath is sort of the intensity, accident intensity field or, or something like that, uh, which shows that the, the sort of time changing behavior of, of accident inten intensities. So clear like uh, it's, it's more dangerous to fly during the summer months and like winter months. And then that periodicity has, has changed over, over years. Uh, I don't have the plot for the weekly, or do I? No, I don't have the plot for the weekly behavior, but there's like a day of week effect. So apparently Wednesday is, is quite dangerous <laughs> to fly on. Question. No, it's not normalized by the number of flights because I couldn't find that data. So what you actually see is the number of like the number of flights per day. So it turns out that the most popular day to, to fly on is Wednesday. And of course it happens like more accidents happen on Wednesday because there are more flights. But it's sort of nice that this actually sort of is recovered there in, by the model. Good point. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a couple of things to cover still. Um, I mentioned spatiotemporal things. So this far it's only been time series. But let's consider that you have uh, higher dimensional inputs than just 1D. And especially that you have something, you have some things that depend on space, space interpreted not only as like 2D space, but could be like any type of like spatial problem. And then that evolves over time. So typically you would have uh, a lot of data points in the temporal di dimension. Say uh, you observe temperature around the globe and you do that every minute or every hour. So then you have a lot of data in time, but not that much data per like spatial dimensions. So now sort of this would be the general form of a model, so not just let's split the inputs x into r and t, where t is time and r is whatever spatial thing you, you, you have as inputs. So it turns out that uh, you can actually do the same, same thing kind of as we did for the pure temporal thing. Uh, but now you end up with having a stochastic partial differential equation, which sounds scary and actually is. Um, and th like this behavior is not as nice as for the normal SDs. But turns out that you can do all kinds of nice things here as well. Uh, you need to take some sort of approximative steps here and there, depending a bit on your model. But uh, just as an example, you remember the, the thing I showed for the, the 1D thing turns out that you can do the same for, for the, the a 2D thing, where you have like a spatial variable, x, and then some observations, and then you have time. So now you just sort of consider like things over time, so you consider like the spatial observations. In this case, there's only probably like one spatial point at every time step, but there could be like any number. And of course, this looks horrible, but once you do the, the the backward pass, you actually get the same solution as you would get by a, a sort of uh, normal GP model. Of course, here uh, the kernel is, is sort of 
of, of a very nice kind and so on. So in the general case, it's not this easy as it might appear, but you can still do it. It's quite powerful in the cases where you have a lot of data over time and not that many spatial points. So then this might be a smart thing to consider. And of course, like if you think of random draws from models like this, here there's like a modern uh, actually one model like uh, space time. Uh, this is non-separable, non-separable, separ separable. Is that clear? So uh, your kernel is can be said to be separable if you can write your kernel as a product of, in this case. And then we have some R. So if you can write this as a product of some kernel in time and some kernel in space, then it's separable over space and time. So for example, this, this squared exponential would be separable per, per, per se. Uh, the matern, like lower order materns, are not. So that's why it's sort of interesting that you actually do it for those. But then if you think of, uh, like here's a separable matern, a squared exponential, and then there's like a periodic thing in, in space and in time. Yeah, you can do these things. Pretty interesting, I think. Okay, I'm slowly, or actually quickly, uh, running out of time. So I have collected a couple of, oh, sorry, uh, Alan. What's the, what's the scaling in terms of the spatial dimensions? Like? It's cubic. So it's cubic, but it's spatial multiplied by linear time. Exactly, yeah. And, but of course, like now you're cubic in space, but all the usual things you can do for speeding up GPs for, for like normal, like inducing point approximation, so on, you can do for the spatial part. So if you, if you had two dimensional space you wanted to move around time, it would be two If you're two, uh, yeah, if you have two spatial dimensions and time, would it be eight times slower than if you were just doing time? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but of course, like you could then apply all sort of the normal approximations. Um, yeah. So, application examples. Um, yeah. Uh, what if the data really is sort of infinite? That it just keeps coming and never ends. So then sort of it's no use waiting for the data stream to end and do inference. It's better to do this right away once the data is coming because it's never going to stop. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, I'm sure if it loops or not. So this is a classification task. So you have a non-Gaussian likelihood. Uh, and the, the dashed line is actually the, the state space thing. And then there's like an approximation uh, scheme here. So then it can, I think, does it loop? No, it doesn't loop, but it should loop. Uh, so it just starts over and over again because sort of it returns back to the, the, the mean. But here, sort of, this is really online. So, like, the thing is updated on every data point, it keeps updating. And uh, of course, then, if you take this one step further, then you don't sort of have time to wait for the data, sort of, to, to have a batch of data, optimize your hyperparameters deploy that model and look at the results if you all also need to learn the hyperparameters sort of on the fly. And this thing, I've told you this is fast. And this thing actually is implemented on my iPhone. So this really runs on my iPhone in real time. And data that comes in is data from the, the actuometer in this case. So basically I create data by moving the phone or shaking it. So here you see the, the GP fit and here you see the the uh, length scale and magnitude hyperparameters. So it's learned on the fly, adapted to the model once the data comes in. So it learns the hyperparameters once the data streams in. And it really runs in real time. And the data stream can be infinite, basically, because the, well, the, as long as the phone feeds in data, it keeps estimating these things. So you see sort of it adapts. So for example, now there's sort of fast movement. The length scale goes down. Our, uh, and the magnitude might go up if I apply more force. 
Yeah, this, at least the video is pretty long. It's actually quite fun. Uh, so you see it adapts to the, to the incoming data. Yeah, it's forgetting the past in this case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have like 15 minutes of this. So <laughs> let's move forward. <laughs> it's actually really fun. <laughs> um, and then as a final example, this. Uh, 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 so uh, does it work uh, also in uh, uh, multi outputs? Um, short answer yes. Uh, long answer very long. Um, so what sort of multi-output are, are you considering? Uh, what, are the, mm, what are the options? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so of course, like if, you, if your multi-output would be, for example, the, the, the uh, process itself and its derivative, that would be extremely simple. No. Yeah. If it would be something else, uh, if, the, if, if the outputs or like the, uh, would it be sort of multi-input as well? Or yeah, uh, still like short answer yes, long answer complicated to build. Yeah. <laughs> okay. As a final example, uh, this is actually something very recent. Uh, this actually worked by one of my students who is in the audience. Yushen is there in the back row. Um, this, uh, I really like this. Uh, so the problem is single camera depth estimation, which sounds very much like neural networks, deep learning. Uh, that's what they do in computer vision. So basically, it's an infinite stream of, of camera frames that comes in. And well, it turns out that you, you can take like a pair of frames and pass them through uh, like, a, um, like an encoder network, which you learn. Uh, and then we have like a couple thing over time. We have like a hidden state where we put like a GP prior on that state. Because sort of if you think of like if you see something and estimate the depth and you have sort of some, some hidden state uh, associated with that. And then you just move a tiny bit. The hidden state should be pretty similar, which should make sense. So uh, we came up with a special kind of a covariance structure to encode, uh, enc uh, like encode kind of the similarity measure here. Uh, and then we, we, we built this model uh, with like, the encoder and decoder networks and chose to train that with, with the GP. Um, and it, it's sort of an unholy alliance, but it actually works pretty nicely. And then I also forced Shen to implement it to run on my iPad. So this is actually screen cap from my iPad. And this is my, my, my room in, in the university. Uh, it's usually not this tidy. It's a bit artificial. Um, so here, this is actually just screen cap uh, from, from the iPad. So you see first, it hasn't seen much, so it's very noisy. But then the GP kicks in, and it can actually do like single camera depth estimation. The, the iPad only has one camera, so it has no stereo vision. Um, and it's a bit laggy, but it still runs in real time on the device. I think it's really cool. I'm, I'm extremely proud of this. <laughs> OK, uh, I'm probably running out of time. Um, Sorry, uh, How sensitive was this to, as you said, you had to come up with a very specialized covariance structure? Uh, how so much iteration was involved? Not, not this was the first try. So it's sort of the, the, uh, the similarity kind of uh, distance measure is between distance of poses, basically. So the more you move, the less similar it should, should be. Yeah, so the, the iPad has this built-in thing that you can get like a pose estimate uh, for like a visual inertial thing. We use that. Yeah. Okay, I, I need to move faster. Uh, okay, um, so Gaussian processes, I'm trying to say that uh, cheap is under kernel formalism and the same thing under the SD formalism uh, is actually uh, very much related. Going from one form to another is very nice. So it might be nicer to specify the model here, but it might be a lot nicer to solve the model here. So specify it here, transform it here, and then use the Kalman filter for solving. 
Or then you can go the other way around. You might have some knowledge from physics or, or dynamics that you can already sort of, you already have it as an ODE, for example. Then you can just input that here and go the other way around. Uh, I gave you three different interpretations of GPs. Uh, well, I mostly consider like temporal, like single uh, dimensional input spaces, uh, which gives you SDs. And uh, well, I think this is a very nice connection between different things and can actually help out a lot in practical applications, as you saw in, in the examples. And uh, you can really do exact inference in ON with this. Keep that in mind. Great. Uh, the SDE connections uh, are mostly covered in, in these publications. Uh, Simo Särke, who is my former PhD supervisor, has a very, very nice book on Kalman filtering from like a Bayesian perspective. Uh, I think that's sort of a very nice read. Uh, we also published a book uh, with Simo uh, this year uh, about applied SDEs, where the last chapter is actually on these things. Uh, the spatiotemporal stuff, uh, my thesis from a couple of years ago, is quite good for that. You might recognize some, some familiar names here. Um, so for example, the banded matrix stuff by, by Nicholas. Uh, someone asked about that. Uh, have a look at that paper. Uh, and yeah, the non-Gaussian likelihoods and uh, then some of the nice applications I showed are covered in these papers. Uh, codes and more videos and stuff, uh, you can find on my web page. And the book which I mentioned, it's actually, you can of course buy it, uh, I wouldn't mind, but it's also freely available as a PDF on my web page. So if you want to read it, you can just go and read it. Thanks a lot. Any questions? This, yeah. <laughs> I think it's scattered uh, in different places. Uh, I think many of these things are implemented. Uh, not all things probably are publicly available, <laughs> though, uh, because this is very sort of good for like practical things. If you really have some model that you want to have, have like a cheap model which you have, want to have running in a drone or a car or something, this is maybe sort of the go-to solution to actually do that. Mm -hmm. But then often if it's a company implementing that, then they're probably not sharing what they do. But uh, there is in GPI, there's a branch with some of these things. In the uh, GPML toolbox, Hannes Nikish has an implementation uh, of these things. Uh, in GPML, uh, and it, in the GP stuff toolbox, which is maybe a bit outdated, there's also like uh, these things implemented for like GP regression. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to to have sort of more code available at some point. Yeah. Um, more questions? So what are the kind of like large data sets you have pushed through using this sort of thing? Very large. So like millions of data points. Uh, yeah. I think in the in this paper, uh, in the in the Infinite Horizon paper, I think I don't quite remember. I think it was in the millions of the data we used there. But it's sort of the number of data points is sort of uninteresting because you're linear. So you you still have to wait longer, but it will finish. So yeah. It's not an issue in that that sense. Uh, there's a question. Basically, we, like, we hope it's encoding depth, but with deep learning models, uh, sort of, because the encoder decoder structure, uh, it might be encoding something like the colors of the chair. We, we don't know, but it works. And it actually works uh, also like in more general cases, than just not, not only in my office. 
So the training data set did not contain like any images from my office, for example. But yeah, so the, my answer is maybe that, well, we, we, we don't enforce it. <laughs> So the, the input is, is basically, uh, let's, let's go back here. So the input is actually sort of two, like two frames at a time. Uh, so this sort of, there should be some information. So the, even if you decouple these and only like, consider like these independently, it returns something sensible, kind of. Uh, but of course it helps to sort of have a constraint that like nearby poses should have the same depth. Yeah, because if everything would be still, there wouldn't be sort of any stereo things to infer from, from the frames. Yeah. More questions? I th this was the last presentation, by the way. Uh, someone should probably say something <laughs> grand at this point. I thought I said something grand. <laughs> 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 at the end of the summer school part of this, so uh, there's a uh, uh, more kind of researchy uh, day planned tomorrow. So then we've got four talks, including uh, Arno again, first thing in the morning, <laughs> talking about how we kind of build uh, physical information into covariance structures and uh, get Gaussian bridges that kind of base physical um, structures. So this, the brewery tour tonight, um, there are the certificates over there, and Steve attended and so on. They've all been stamped by Karibo with a uh, official Gaussian process summer school stamp, so they, you know, <laughs> they like it. Um, but before we go, can we just thank again all the speakers and all the helpers who've helped out this week and put it all together? So thank you. Oh, that's it for today. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Do you want the slides? Yeah, uh, please. Yeah.